I'm Maddie, I'm a psychology PhD student at the University of Bristol and my research is on the relationship between anxiety and alcohol use. And tonight I'm going to talk about the complexities of the relationship, introduce some of the methods I use as a researcher to investigate the relationship and present some of my research findings that I've got throughout my PhD. So anxiety and alcohol problems are common issues and they if they're left untreated, they can severely affect people's lives from their work to their relationships and their health. So it's important to investigate how these problems are linked because ultimately it might help researchers to try and identify how to prevent and treat these conditions. So I'll start off with talking about anxiety. It can broadly be classed into three different groups. First of all, state anxiety, which is more transient feelings of anxiety in response to environmental stressor. So, for example, feeling anxious when you're doing an exam. Once the um, stressor has passed and the exam is finished, the anxieties should dissipate. And it's the anxiety that most of us feel in those stressful situations. Trait anxiety is a more stable personality characteristic. So this, some people are more anxious on average compared to other people, regardless of the situation. And anxiety disorders are psychiatric disorders characterised by excessive fear and anxiety, for example, generalised anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder and panic disorder. And anxiety can affect your thoughts, emotions and your behaviours. So take social anxiety, for example. So people who have this disorder tend to fear social or performance situations such as talking in meetings, giving presentations, going to parties, dating. And so when faced with one of these stressful situations, they interpret it as a threat. And they see, and so they start with having the thoughts of, this is a stressful situation, I might humiliate myself, this could be embarrassing, people are going to reject me. And that could lead to self-conscious emotions, such as fear and embarrassment. That then triggers off a fight or flight response, which is normally adaptive if you've got a real stressful situation that you should be responding to. Um, and then a, a, um, a sequence of somatic sensations such as shaking, trembling, dry mouth, racing heart then follows and that can lead to safety behaviours such as avoiding those types of situations, choosing not to go to parties or give presentations and that is a vicious cycle because if you avoid the situations you end up having a reduction in your anxiety. So anxiety is a common problem. About one in six of us will, interpret, um, will experience an anxiety disorder at some point in our lives. And women tend to experience it more frequently than men. And then alcohol use can also be broadly categorised into three groups. So first of all, general frequency and quantity of use, just general levels of consumption. Binge drinking, which is a high level of consumption on a specific episode in one occasion. And that's classed by the NHS as more than eight units for men, which is about four pints, and more than six units for women, which is about three pints. And also problem drinking or alcohol use disorders. So when problem drinking leads to a medical disorder, alcohol dependence or alcohol abuse, um, this is um, characterised by craving for alcohol, tolerance to alcohol, needing more to get the same effects and withdrawal symptoms. So it's a chronic relapsing disorder. And alcohol use and alcohol problems tend to be more frequent um, in men compared to women. And about 1 in 25 people will experience an alcohol use disorder, so about 4%. So alcohol has different effects on the brain. It affects our thoughts, emotions and behaviours. And it's important to think about these effects in order uh, for us to understand why people are drinking. So first of all, anxiety has positively reinforcing effects. So in small doses, it's stimulating. It makes people feel good, it gives people pleasure. Um, and it affects neurotransmitters in the brain, such as dopamine and neuroadrenaline. It also has negatively reinforcing effects. So it actually takes away things like stress and anxiety in small amounts. It can make people feel more relaxed. And because it takes away something negative, it increases the chance that someone's going to do that behaviour again. So it's negatively reinforcing. However, paradoxically, alcohol is biphasic. So although it could be stimulating in small doses, it can be a depressant in large doses. So chronic 
Heavy drinkers will experience the punishing effects of alcohol and it becomes a sedative. So feeling dizzy, um, passing out, memory loss, and in impaired decision making and other cognitive functions. And this helps us to understand why people drink. So people are drinking for the positively and negatively reinforcing effects and they're typically trying to avoid the punishing aversive sedative effects. So researchers have come up with four key motives to explain why people drink. So first of all, social reasons. People drink to enhance a social event, to celebrate a special occasion with friends because it's fun. Enhancement reasons, because they like the feeling, it gives them pleasure. And these relate to the positively reinforcing effects of alcohol. Some people also drink for conformity reasons, so to avoid peer rejection or to avoid being yeah, excluded from the group, criticism, or they drink for coping reasons, to avoid the feelings of anxiety or stress or depression. So these bottom two motives are relating to the negative, negatively reinforcing effects of alcohol. They're taking away something negative which increases the chance of you drinking again. Now, my research has focused on the coping motives because evidence suggests that people who have anxiety are more likely to drink to cope, and drinking to cope is in turn associated with a higher risk of alcohol problems. So what is the relationship between anxiety and alcohol use? So the relationship is currently unclear, it's complex, and I'm going to talk you through some of the main theories. Um, they're not mutually exclusive. Any or a combination of them could be true and it could vary depending on the individual. So first of all, there's some evidence to suggest that um, people with anxiety tend to drink more. Um, so they might drink to cope with those negative feelings of stress. Um, and this is known as the self-medication <laughs> hypothesis. Alternatively, some other research has found that those with higher levels of anxiety actually drink less or avoid alcohol. So that might be because they're avoiding the social situations where alcohol is normally consumed, they're not going to the parties where there is alcohol, or perhaps they're worried about the potential negative consequences of drinking. They're fearful of embarrassing themselves, or they're maybe worried about the negative um, harmful effects of drinking. So that might lead to this uh, negative relationship. And if talking about the reverse causal pathway, alcohol use might actually lead to higher anxiety levels. So in the short term, if you've had a, a, a night out binge drinking, you might experience a hangover. And some of those hangover symptoms resemble feelings of anxiety. You've got feelings of low mood, worrying about what you might have done the night before, shaking a bit. But also more, more seriously among chronic drinkers, if they're drinking heavily in the long term, that can lead to anxiety through biological mechanisms. So we know that heavy drinking can actually have those opposite effects on the neurotransmitters that I spoke about. It could decrease levels of dopamine, decrease levels of um, GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. And so biologically, it could lead to more anxiety. Also through social mechanisms. So perhaps if people develop an alcohol problem, that can have an effect on their work, they might lose their job, or it might impact their relationships. And in turn, that might lead to feelings of anxiety and depression. And then some studies have found no clear evidence of an association between these two things. So perhaps there are shared risk factors at play. So maybe genetic or social factors are leading to both these things separately. So, for example, earlier experiences of trauma might be leading to a development of anxiety and the development of alcohol use and alcohol problems separately, which is suggesting there's an association, but actually they're not linked. So why are there mixed findings? I should say that my research is actually focusing on anxiety leading to later alcohol use and whether it leads to more drinking or less drinking, or whether there's no clear evidence of an association. I'm not looking at the reverse causal pathway of whether alcohol use leads to higher anxiety levels. So why are there mixed findings? So it might be due to study differences. So as I said, there are different types of anxiety. So maybe if studies, some studies are looking at one type of anxiety disorder, it could be a certain type of relationship with drinking. Maybe people with social phobia, social anxiety are drinking more whereas people with panic disorder might be drinking less. 
It might depend on the type of alcohol outcome we're talking about, whether it's um, alcohol dependence or just whether you are drinking on every night of the week. Or, so level of consumption versus an actual alcohol use disorder. So because there are different types of anxiety, different types of alcohol use, they may have different associations. Study designs. There's some evidence that um, anxiety and alcohol problems tend to co-occur more frequently in treatment-seeking individuals, so in clinical samples. Whereas those associations, those comorbidity rates are lower in the general population. So it really depends what kind of sample researchers are using. And also study quality. Um, perhaps if studies have a low sample size, they've um, been influenced, they've got bias and they've been influenced by other factors, they might be giving us the incorrect answer. So there might be mixed findings also because the influence of other factors. So the relationship might not be as simple as saying, oh, anxiety is leading to later alcohol use. Perhaps there needs to be an interaction that we need to be aware of. So maybe anxiety and the presence of uh, a certain personality trait, like impulsivity, makes people drink more. Or perhaps the relationship only occurs in a certain age group, um, a certain ethnic group, or people of a certain um, social class. Maybe there are underlying genetic factors at play. So we know that in about a third of populations with East Asian ancestry, they tend to find the um, alcohol a bit more aversive because they lack an enzyme to break down alcohol. So perhaps that relationship is only shown in certain genetic groups. And also contextual factors. Maybe anxiety is only leading to greater alcohol use in particular social situations or contexts. And these complicating factors could account for some of the mixed findings. So what methods do researchers use? So methods can be broadly um, grouped into observational, non-experimental methods and experimental methods. These are the methods that I'm using in my research. So observational methods are when researchers measure anxiety and alcohol use without experimental manipulation or intervention. So for example, there might be a questionnaire where you ask participants, how anxious were you feeling in the last week? How much alcohol use did you drink? How much alcohol did you drink in the last week? That'd be an example of a cross-sectional study where you take participants at one point in time and then you look at the link between the two things. Cohort studies or prospective cohort studies are like a longitudinal study. So instead of measuring those things at one point in time, we might ask participants when they are a teenager, how anxious are you feeling? Do you have an anxiety disorder? And then we follow up those same participants when they're adults, and we then say, how much are you drinking? How, are you experiencing any alcohol problems? So those are observational methods because we're not manipulating anxiety or alcohol use in any way. We're just asking people about it. Alternatively, we've got experimental methods. So here, researchers manipulate anxiety. They create high and low anxiety conditions and then see what the effects are on alcohol use, alcohol-related behaviours. There's different ways that researchers can do this. In social phobics, they might induce anxiety by asking them to give a presentation without preparing. But in our lab, we use this model called the carbon dioxide model of anxiety induction. And basically what we do is we give participants 7.5% CO2 enriched air. They inhale that gas and that induces state anxiety in those individuals. They show symptoms, raised heart rate, raised blood pressure, and it correlates with subjective feelings of state anxiety. So by manipulating that, giving participants that type of gas and a medical air placebo, and then getting them to do computer tasks or questionnaires measuring their alcohol use, we compare the difference. So observational studies are useful when we can't manipulate the variable of interest. So for example, we wouldn't be able to induce an alcohol disorder in people by asking participants to drink heavily for the next few months and then see whether they develop anxiety. So experiments are useful when we're looking at things in the short term, when we can temporarily make people anxious or to temporarily get people, give people alcohol so they're intoxicated and then see the effects. And experiments are useful because they can better determine cause and effects relationships. So we can 
manipulate the variable of interest but keep everything else constant in that laboratory environment. And by keeping it constant, we can see whether the variable of interest anxiety is causing the effect on the outcome. And then another method that researchers use and I use, um, systematic reviews and meta-analyses. So if studies are sufficiently similar, researchers can combine all the evidence from those studies into what's called a systematic review. And that's really useful because if studies are showing the same thing with different samples, but they're each showing the same thing, that increases the reliability and the validity of our evidence. Um, and meta-analyses are used with a systematic review when your um, studies are sufficiently similar, they're comparable enough to statistically pull that information together. So I'm going to run through some of the studies that I've been conducting during my PhD. So the first study I did was a systematic review and meta-analysis, and that was on previous studies that are looked at childhood and adolescent anxiety and they were investigating whether those disorders were linked to alcohol use, alcohol-related alcohol behaviours at least six months later. So what I did is I looked through all the literature and I gathered every single study that had looked at that relationship and I found 51 studies that looked at anxiety in childhood and adolescence and measured their alcohol use and alcohol-related behaviours at least six months later. And three of those studies we decided were sufficiently similar to statistically combine in a meta-analysis. And what we found was there was, an evidence, there was evidence for a link between anxiety and later alcohol use disorders. So the majority of studies did find that if children and adolescents had anxiety, there was an increased risk of alcohol use disorders, alcohol problems, at least six months later. So for pro problematic use, there was an evidence of a link. But for more general levels of consumption, so drinking frequency and quantity and binge drinking, there was no clear evidence of a link between anxiety and those alcohol-related behaviours. So there was a difference there. There was a, some studies that found anxiety increased your risk for drinking, other studies found anxiety decreased your risk for drinking, and others found equivocal evidence. And we also did a meta-analysis and found having generalised anxiety, there was no clear evidence of a link with alcohol use disorder based on those three studies that we looked at. So we then did our own cohort study. So that systematic review were, was on other, other people's cohort studies. So now we did our own cohort study. And we focused on generalised anxiety disorder specifically. And we wanted to know, was that linked to frequent drinking, binging, hazardous drinking, harmful drinking at age 18, so cross-sectionally at the same time point, and prospectively three years later? So do the effects of anxiety actually last over time? And we also had a second question. So if you remember before, I was saying perhaps other factors might be influencing these associations. So we thought maybe coping motives, those tendencies to drink to cope, might be influencing the relationship. So we wanted to see, is it presence of anxiety and the tendency to drink for coping reasons, does that lead to later alcohol use? So we used the Avon Longitudinal Study of Parents and Children, and that's otherwise known as Children of the 90s. So this is a really valuable resource that we have in Bristol. So in the early 1990s, about 14,000 pregnant mothers were recruited and their offspring have been followed up um, until the present day. So there's information about them, the mothers, the mother's partners. And now we've even got information about the children of the children of the 90s. So um, I, I, this was a secondary data analysis study. I used data from this cohort. And I was particularly interested in the anxiety when they were teenagers, when they were age 18, their drinking behaviour when they're 18, and their drinking behaviour later when they were 21. As you can see, the sample size reduced over that time. So the problem with longitudinal studies, and Ausback's no exception, people tend to drop out over time, unfortunately. So with those more longitudinal associations, we had a slightly smaller sample size. So what did we find? 
So we did find evidence for a link between generalised anxiety disorder and all our alcohol outcomes at age 18. So cross-sectionally, at the same time, there was an association. And the association only remained for harmful drinking three years later. So at the most severe forms of drinking, harmful drinking, anxiety continued to be a risk factor for harmful drinking later in life, three years later. Drinking to cope, supporting the previous literature, really did strongly predict all alcohol outcomes. But it didn't influence the anxiety association. So there seems to be a separate thing going on. Anxiety influencing alcohol use, drinking to cope influencing alcohol use, but no sort of interaction between the two. I then did a cross-sectional study in a different sample. So this time I was interested in state anxiety, so those general transient fluctuations in anxiety that people naturally experience rather than a severe anxiety disorder. So I was wondering whether this is linked to alcohol choice and a craving for alcohol. Now the reason I did this study was because a previous, um, previous researchers in our lab group had done a study using the carbon dioxide model that I talked about. So they'd manipulated state anxiety and they'd found that in the, state, in the high anxiety condition, people chose alcohol more over other rewards like food. And so I wanted to see, OK, are we going to get the same results if we just measure this in a questionnaire? So comparing experimental and observational findings. So got a bunch of participants and they did a survey online. Um, so it involved questionnaires about their state anxiety, trait anxiety, their craving for alcohol. And we also got them to do a computer task. So we like to use computer tasks as well as questionnaires because they're an implicit way of showing your motivation for alcohol use. So questionnaires are directly, explicitly saying to people, how much are you wanting alcohol right now? How much are you drinking? And those are subject to some biases. So some people might um, experience memory biases or social desirability biases. They might not be honest about what they're drinking. Whereas computer tasks are a bit more implicit. They can subtly detect motivation for alcohol. So what we did is we showed them images of food, so typical UK meals and alcoholic drinks, and they were just asked to choose what image do you prefer. It was a very, um, yeah, indirect question, what, what image do you prefer? And this task actually correlates with severity of alcohol dependence. So people who choose the alcoholic pictures more, um, that correlates with severity of dependence. So what did we find? So actually, it didn't support a previous experimental study. State anxiety wasn't linked to choosing alcohol on that task. But there was some evidence that it was linked to your craving for alcohol. So feeling anxious in that moment was linked to your craving for alcohol. We also looked at trait anxiety that was associated with craving and again drinking to cope those coping motives were associated with our alcohol outcomes. And then finally I'm working on a laboratory experiment of myself. Um, this is unfinished so I'll just talk through the methods. So again, we experimentally manipulated state anxiety in the lab using this carbon dioxide model. And we wanted to see whether we could replicate the first study. Does it link to alcohol choice? Does it link to approach tendencies for alcohol? And I'll explain what those are in a minute. And does state anxiety link to craving? And once again, we wanted to see, OK, so we didn't find any evidence that coping motives were influencing the um, relationship in our big cohort study with children of the 90s, but perhaps it shows something with state fluctuations, perhaps it shows something in an experimental study. So what is involved was participants would sign up to the study, they'd complete a screening questionnaire where I'd assess whether they tended to drink to cope, they were high on that scale, or whether they didn't, whether they were low on that scale. I then phoned people up and we screened them um, to check that they were medically um, suitable to take part. And then they completed a 2.5 hour lab session. So during the session, they'd experience the CO2 inhalation, which would induce anxiety. And they would also have a placebo air inhalation, which was 
to not induce anxiety, um, a low anxiety condition. And during that procedure, they'll complete two computer tasks. So the choice task again, and this approach avoidance task. So what happens here is they're shown alcoholic and soft drinks, and there's a joystick. And around each image is either a solid border or a dashboard a cue. And they're told if it's one or the other, you need to push the image away or pull towards you. If you push, the image gets smaller to mimic it being going into the distance. And if you pull it towards you, the image gets bigger to mimic it coming closer towards you. So if you've got a preference for something, the idea is you're going to be faster at pulling an image towards you and slower at pushing it away. So we use, some people use this task when, with people who've got um, phobias. So they might show them images of spiders or snakes and people with phobias would be quicker to push that image away than to pull it towards them. So I haven't got findings for that study, but that's what I'm working on at the moment. Um, but the general limitations of these methods then. So the observational methods that I talked about first of all, the Ausback study using the cohort and the cross-sectional online study. So we have to remember that these are just associations. We're not determining causality here. It could be that alcohol use is leading to the anxiety, so the reverse association might be going on. Uh, confounding could be also occurring. So what are confounders? There are other variables that could be influencing the relationship. So it might be that other, these people are using other drugs, they're smoking, and if we don't adjust for these things in our, relationship, in, um, our analyses, they could be spoiling and confounding our relationship. Also issues with self-report measures, as I said, the problem with asking people how much are you drinking, they might forget, they might lie. And issues with our experimental methods. It's a very unnatural situation to be in, inhaling those gases. How much is it like real life? Those tasks with the joystick, yes, they have their uses, but how much are they showing us about real alcohol consumption behaviours? And sample sizes tend to be smaller in experimental studies, so can we generalise those findings to more people? And then finally, with the limitations of systematic reviews and meta-analyses, so they're only as good as the studies that go into a review. So you're pulling together findings from other studies, but if they're rubbish, your review is going to be rubbish. And also, there's a criticism of mixing apples with oranges. So if you try to combine studies that are actually not showing the same, that are not measuring the same thing, you might also lead to distorted conclusions. So it's, the researcher has to make lots of decisions. So is it right to, con uh, to combine studies where they've looked at social anxiety disorder and those which have experienced panic disorder, for example? Maybe it's wrong to combine those studies. So, just to summarise, there are health, social and economic costs associated with anxiety and alcohol problems. It may be the case that helping people to develop positive strategies for coping with their anxiety may reduce the risk of future problem drinking. Further research is needed to determine why the relationship differs for general consumption levels versus problematic drinking which individuals with anxiety are at risk of developing alcohol problems, because these are just population-level studies. We don't know about individual people. We're just saying what the group is doing on average. So who's actually at risk? And how is alcohol use linked to later anxiety? So the reversed associations. So thank you very much for listening. I just want to also say this is our link to the Tobacco and Alcohol Research Group. If you would like to take part in any of our studies, there are lots of study adverts available on our website. And also, if you want more information about some of the studies that I've presented today, a few of them have been published. So if you go on the website, you can find all more information there. So thank you very much. <laughs>